I fancy venturing through the catacombs, which branch off from Farling Shrine. I make sure to pick off the undead mages when I see them. I discovered that the flying exploding skulls, which I think are called wisps, actually attract my homing crystal soul mass, but they can't be damaged. I ended up using the shortcut that goes down through the chasm to the bone wheel skeletons straight away, although on my way down, I encountered the rarest thing in Dark Souls, a vagrant. Most players have never seen one, and there are two main types, evil vagrants and good vagrants. I've identified this one here as a white evil vagrant, evil because it has a claw and a ranged attack and attacks me on sight. So this was a very exciting discovery. I'm very happy that happened while I was recording as well. I actually think it's the first evil vagrant I've ever experienced. What was less exciting was being turned into roadkill by the bone wheel skeletons. Bone wheels are so weak and pathetic in Future Souls games compared to the OGs, these ones will happily stunlock you into infinity without breaking a sweat. They probably can't sweat, actually. But the truth is, they're the real boss of the area, because I ended up smoking Pinwheel in seconds to no one's surprise. This lets us kindle bonfires up to an excessive 20 Estus Flask charges, and for anyone placing bets on what mask I would get this run, it was the Mask of the Mother. The connecting area is the Tomb of the Giants, and this area presents an obvious problem. I have no light source I'm allowed to use, per the rules. The Skull Lantern, the Sunlight Maggot, and the Cast Light Sorcery are all off limits, and those are the only light sources in the game. I was going to have to stumble my way around in the darkness and just hope for the best. Now, Homing Crystal Soul Mass may not have cast any light, but it ended up being a lifesaver. It was my most important tool in this area, as it could essentially replace my eyes. It could still target enemies in the darkness, even if I couldn't see them. Nevertheless, I still fell to my death countless times, whether pushed or otherwise just walked off the edge. It turns out I could still remember the rough layout of genuinely where I was supposed to go, just not the specific distances between the edges of the cliff and the path. Speaking of cliffs, Patches gave me a shove into the pit, helpful as always, and it's even more of a tease this time because this is where the Skull Lantern is. Eventually though, I made it out of the darkness, into the light. The Crystal Lizard here unfortunately did not drop the Titanite chunk I needed, so I pressed on to the spookiest skeleton of them all. The strategy for Nito is fairly simple. Generally, you want to stay put by the entrance, because if you move too far into the room, you'll aggro all the giant skeleton minions hiding around the back. And unless you kill them with a divine weapon, they will respawn infinitely, and I can't use a divine weapon. Something I had forgotten is that you always take a bit of fall damage when entering this fight, you always start on the back foot as a result. However, on my third attempt, I noticed another player's message on the other side of the hole, and so I thought if I landed there, I might be able to drop down without damage. But turns out that wasn't the case, I still took damage. I started using the two-handed spin to win attack with the buffed halberd, primarily to deal damage, but also it's a good way to deal with the surrounding skeleton mobs at the same time. As soon as I started using this strategy, as well as taking care not to aggro the giant skeletons at the back of the room, things started going great. Gravelord Nito went down, quite close now to being able to use Crystal Soul Spear, so my brain was clearly getting very large. I'll probably need a big hat. Moving swiftly on to the Demon Ruins, the entrance of course being under Quelag's domain, this is definitely one of the more disturbing areas in the game. These poor souls are infected with parasites, and there's maggots as well, so it's, it's just gross. Instead, we're aiming for the massive fire giant who has the wonderful title of Ceaseless Discharge. He's called that because his body is the source of the lava that continuously floods the lower levels, making the area impassable. For whatever reason, my homing crystal soul mass wouldn't activate, but even when I started the fight properly by stealing the gold-hemmed black set, they still wouldn't fire. I guess he's too far away or something, but that's okay. Very happy with our output at this level. As you can see, the damage we're doing is fantastic. You'll see when he slams, it appears as though he's nowhere close to me. There's a shockwave when he strikes, so it's best to roll even when it looks unnecessary. 
Once the fire giant is down, the discharge finally ceases and we can access the lower portion of the demon ruins. There's a bunch of random tourist demons to greet us down here, no idea why really, and also some leftover lava which really really hurts. Probably quite realistic, I wouldn't know. Further in there is a great big burrowing rock worm blocking the bonfire I'm trying to access. So I started attacking it. I noticed it had a spitting attack. It spits some sort of liquid that I can't quite remember what effect it has. I then get tricked by a player message. It was a stone demon ambush. That ambush was nothing though compared to what happens next. Four burrowing rock worms trap me from above and surround me and then I found out what their spit attack really does. A corrosive acid that deals 40 durability damage to all equipped items. Obviously my halberd maxes out at 20 durability in the first place, so it broke instantly. And I mean fully broke. It went past the at risk stage straight to completely broken. There was only one thing for it. Back to the most reliable man I know, Blacksmith Andre. He can upgrade my halberd, except not this time. I was completely out of titanite chunks. Even my armor was severely damaged, but at least that's actually repairable. I needed more titanite chunks. So first things first, I went back to Snuggly. I traded a piece of rubbish in exchange for some titanite, which is the best deal in history. I then farmed the Royal Sentinels in Anolondo for a few hours. These two specific Sentinels outside the boss fight have a unique 8% chance to drop a chunk of titanite. Now it took a long while, but eventually I had the three I needed to upgrade my halberd from plus three to plus four, the penultimate upgrade. It always feels so good to have a weapon with max durability. After this challenge, I don't think I'll ever take that for granted again. Back in the demon ruins, I wanted to get some more souls. So I targeted the demon fire sage. This turned out not to be the easy payday I was expecting. I found the hitboxes to be a bit wild this fight and his explosive attacks were tricky to avoid. but I managed with the help of some homing crystal magic. I only ended up receiving 20,000 souls for that victory, but afterwards I unlocked the shortcut elevator connecting the demon ruins back to Quelag's domain, and I used the bonfire there to carry on leveling intelligence. And by this point, we've hit level 48, just two away from unlocking White Dragon Breath, our final spell. Continuing the fiery theme next up is the centipede demon who kept teasing me by attacking me from out of range. I can't walk on the lava until I cut off his right arm and receive the orange charred ring. But I can't do that until he comes closer, which leaves me in quite the pickle. He does come over eventually and I do indeed cut his arm off. And that's when he nearly drags me into the lava. Definitely a close one there. I got quite lucky. I strip everything off now to run across the lava, of course with the orange charred ring equipped. And the reason for that is the constant lava damage actually degrades your armor. Just one more level until 50 intelligence, and additionally we have now entered Lost Isolith, also known as Hell, and home to a never ending army of giant dragon butts. They are apparently known as bounding demons of Lost Isolith, but they don't drop anything, and they only give a few thousand souls and plus they're just weird. Near the end of the section, there's a tower with an illusory wall on one side that gives access to a secret bonfire. And just a few minutes away, there is the boss of this area, the infamous bed of chaos, also known as the Witch of Isolith. For some reason, I thought it didn't aggro until you broke the first route, but that is obviously not the case. Both glowing routes need to be destroyed on each side, but the boss increases in strength and power as you do this. The real issue though is the floor crumbling to pieces every step you take. I managed to destroy both glowing roots on each side. I then quit and reloaded the game. This way you can slide back down and get a straight run directly to the boss and avoid the broken sections of floor on each side. No problems at all. I definitely didn't make three more mistakes on this final stage. No, not me. first try, and then I broke my way through the smaller roots and branches to make my way to the core, where the chaos bug was squirming. 
that's 60,000 souls for the victory, and we have officially hit our final goal of 50 intelligence. This is the White Dragon Breath spell. It can hit multiple targets and climb up walls, and best of all it has a whopping 20 casts. Obviously our catalyst cuts that in half, but even then we have 10 casts to play around with. There is one more Lord Soul to collect before we reach the final location, and this time it's in the ruins of New Londo. Because I'm no longer cursed, I had to use a transient curse consumable item, but thanks to my work earlier draining the city, I can skip most of them and use a shortcut right here at the start to get to the sublevels, where the Dark Wraith Knight rises. The good news is my White Dragon Breath absolutely slaps. It's such a satisfying spell to use. In tight linear sections where your enemies have to line up in front of you, this spell is perfect. Dark Wraith Knights actually have an 8% chance to drop Titanite chunks as well, so they're a potential alternative farming location from the Royal Sentinels. There are mini bosses down here as well, big lumps of slime, which slows me down, and occasionally they give birth to those exploding wisps. Once I got past all of that, it's time to follow in Artorius' footsteps and brave the abyss. It's compulsory now to put on his ring, and then after some skydiving, we enter the domain of the Four Kings. And straight away I notice my homing crystal soul mass works very well, but the white dragon breath is horrible. It doesn't appear to land properly at all in this area, and that's even if you can even cast it at all, because the wind up is so long, the Four Kings always punished me. This first attempt ended with me getting nuked. I swapped to the Crystal Soul Spear in my second attempt, which worked well. I mean, it landed and did great damage. But again, because of my catalyst, I'm restricted to only two casts, which isn't much for a longer boss fight like this. That didn't stop me from being one hit away from beating the boss, however, on my second try, and yet still falling to greed. How embarrassing. This happened again, for some reason. I killed the first three kings relatively easily, and then died to the fourth, just a few hits from victory, which doesn't really make sense because they all share the exact same moveset. Fourth time lucky, despite being bear hugged and having the life sucked out of me, I'm pretty sure this grab attack actually does steal humanity, so it's a good thing I didn't have any on me. I spent my souls on repairing my crystal armor, because it's a crystal set, there's a penalty, and then I put the rest into an endurance level. Havel's ring comes back on, and it's back to Filing Shrine. This time with all four Lord Souls in my shiny hands. It's been years since I've completed a playthrough of Dark Souls 1. The journey of the Geologist would soon be complete. On top of that, my days of Titanite problems are over. The only enemies in this area are Black Knights, who respawn and who are guaranteed to drop Titanite chunks of various sorts. Now, we can all hear that fateful piano music. At this point, most players would be preparing themselves for the ultimate parry check, but that won't be the case for me today. Reminder that the Crystal Shield doesn't have a parry function, only a bash. For that reason, I don't know if people would be surprised to hear this or not, but I think this might have been the boss I struggled with the most in the entire playthrough. Either that or it just felt that way. Because of the setup of this fight, it's an excessively long run back each time across the whole area, just for a very quick death. Gwyn is noticeably quicker than other enemies. He also reacts to what you do and when you've played more recent games like Elden Ring, that's not exactly new anymore. But in Dark Souls it's different. I would suggest Dark Souls forces you to commit to your choice. Whether that's healing, rolling, attacking, whatever it is, the high stamina costs and movement locks you into your choice. And if you've chosen poorly, you will be punished. The funny thing is, I lost track of my attempts, but my final one only lasted about 40 or 50 seconds. I think because of his wild aggression, whether you win or lose, the fight will never last a long time. One playthrough later and my full crystal build is practically complete, and quite impressive if I say so myself. 
I've answered the question of whether it's possible to beat Dark Souls using only Crystal. I'm sure everyone already knew the answer, but it was a really fun journey nonetheless. It almost makes me want to try out the DLC with these restrictions. 